Welcome to Book Talk. Britain's almost unique amongst Western democracies in not having a constitution which sets out its fundamental political rules. Other countries like America created their constitutions after wars of independence or revolutions. Brits haven't known such events for centuries. But might leaving the EU now force a generation of British politicians to pick up their quills and try their hand at constitution writing? Well, my guest today thinks so, and he warns that if they don't, the United Kingdom itself might become unglued. He's the leading constitutional scholar, Professor Vernon Bogdanor. So, Vernon, why does Brexit mean that we ought to have, in your view at least, a, a, a written constitution? Well, the whole Brexit process, and indeed our engagement with Europe, has exposed a huge number of constitutional issues. For example, would we have the referendum if we hadn't joined Europe in the 1970s? Our first national referendum was in 1975 on whether we should stay in Europe or not. That led to a two-to-one majority for staying in. But as you know, the recent one in 2016 led to a small majority for leaving. That itself has raised huge questions about whether we should have referendums, whether they should be set special majorities for referendums, whether Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland should have a veto, uh, and so on. And then when joining Europe, we abrogated our basic principle of the sovereignty of Parliament, because we were, in effect, under European Union law. And although an Ireland, or almost everyone else said, well, we don't have a constitution, perhaps when we were in the European Union, we did live under a constitution, because we were bound by the European Union. To take one issue, which is very important, if, if Parliament and people had wanted to ban immigration from the European Union or restrict it while we were members, it simply couldn't do it. It was against the rules of the European Union, the Four Freedoms. Now we're leaving, so we're doing something rather unusual, leaving a constitutional system for a system which has no constitution. But what's to say that we couldn't just click back into the status quo as it were before we entered the European Union? We seem to muddle by fairly adequately then. Uh, what would be the problem about not having a written constitution and just, as it were, going back to the old way? Well, before we entered Europe, Parliament was fully sovereign. In practice, what that, that meant was that government was omnicompetent, it could do really what it liked, because most of the time, admittedly not now, but most of the time, we have majority governments which control parliament. Now that system was characterised by the Conservative Lord Chancellor, Lord Hailsham, in 1976, as one of elective dictatorship. Now do we want to move back to that? It's more difficult now because we live in a multinational state, we've got devolution, with powers for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, and we're much more conscious of our rights now than we were. We've had since the year 2000 the Human Rights Act embodying the European Convention of Human Rights. That has nothing to do with the European Union, but a quite different body, the Council of Europe. People are now much more self-conscious about their rights, more aware of them, more willing to affirm their rights, and of course we do live in a multicultural and multi-denominational society. There's much less consensus than say 60 years ago and much less deference towards political authority. So that may mean the sovereignty of Parliament is no longer acceptable as our only constitutional principle. Well, You, you argue in this book that we need almost a kind of constitutional corset to keep the UK together. I think that's right. We do need specific rules about a devolution, what powers can be devolved and what can't. To take one example from the Brexit process, Parliament decided to tacitly amend the devolution legislation by keeping some of the agriculture and fisheries powers coming from Brussels, keeping those powers for itself, because in the devolution legislation that belongs to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. But Parliament decided, perhaps reasonably, that you couldn't have four totally different systems of agricultural subsidies in the United Kingdom. Now, the Scots objected to that, and there was an important Supreme Court case in last December which decided against the Scots because the courts said that the so-called Sewell Convention, which means that Parliament doesn't legislate for Scotland or Wales or Northern Ireland without their express consent, is only a convention. It's not justiciable. But looked at from Scotland, it's fundamental. So you could say, not that we have no constitution, but that we have four different ones, depending whether you're looking at it from Westminster, from Edinburgh, 
from Cardiff or from Belfast. Well, I'm trying to imagine this process of trying to put together a UK constitution that would, as it were, define all that and set out a nice set of rules that everybody understood. And would the simple act of trying to draw up that rule book be in itself a pretty divisive exercise? Suppose you said to Scotland, as there's the UK government, you can't have that power. And Scotland said, we want that power. Haven't you there created a flare-up right away and something that might set the cracks through, running through the Union now widening? Absolutely. It's a very complex matter, certainly. I think the best way to begin is not to try and draw up a constitution in one fell swoop, but to begin with a charter on the rights and duties of the devolved bodies. And ideally, that should be achieved by consensus. That, that perhaps maybe are a hopeful proposition to state. It would have to be, I think, endorsed by a referendum in the devolved areas. I think we could... But what about England? I mean, England's well, the biggest part of the United Kingdom, uh, and I think there's one of, perhaps one of the drivers of Brexit was the feeling that England didn't get a say, whereas other parts of the UK did. That's absolutely right. And there's a huge English question which governments perhaps haven't yet resolved. I think what is clear is that England does not want legislative devolution in the way that Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have it. An English Parliament would just overwhelm the United Kingdom. It would create another set of MPs uh, and bureaucrats, which I think no one wants. And John Major once said, if the answer's more politicians, you're asking the wrong question. So I don't think anyone wants that. And I don't think anyone wants English regional bodies with legislative powers. Do you want different laws in Newcastle from the laws in Bristol? Clearly not. So devolution in England has to be dealt with in a different way. And I think the Cameron government gave a good start to it with the so-called Northern Powerhouse proposals, which give you non-legislative devolution in the large regional areas of England. For example, there's a Greater Manchester Authority, an authority in the West Midlands and so on, with a directly elected mayor. Now, that has to be fitted in to the devolution structure. It's not easy, but we're not clear about the rules. And I think it would be helpful if we could get clarity on where we stand in that area. I mean, one of the things that really shines through in this book mm. is your irritation as a distinguished constitutional scholar at the way that constitutional change has been done in Britain for 20 years. It, it's incredibly ad hoc, it comes along when there's a problem, someone actually sort of, as it were, applies a bit of duct tape to the emerging hole in the constitution and moves on and forgets about it. And the strains and stresses of all these ad hoc repairs and sort of bodge jobs that go on are now accumulating. That's absolutely right. And there's a very good example in the case of Scotland that ministers panicked at the time of the Scottish independence referendum of 2014 and offered to devolve in practice almost the whole of income tax powers to Scotland. Now that's more devolution than you get in a decentralised federal state like for example Switzerland where about 12.5% of income tax powers are still with the federal government. But this does illustrate my general point I think. Someone once said that we live under a system of tacit understandings but the understandings are not always understood, and I think that is really our problem. I suppose this is one of the things, though, about the, 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 on, on the other side of the coin of having an unwritten constitution, is that you've got a, a much more adaptable, it's non-document, I suppose, you've got a much more adaptable system. You are not bound to some great clumsy process of requiring a two-thirds majority in an umpteen number of states before you can change your federal constitution in the way that a lot of states with elaborate constitutions are. You can just change the understanding. And you can get nailed to constitutional systems that are that perhaps reflect past values. You know, the, I suppose maybe the right to bear arms in the United States looks a bit archaic these days, for example, but it's still there in the Constitution and it's never, never, never going to be changed. You do have this advantage of flexibility and adaptability, it's true, but what that means in practice is that government can do what it likes. And do we not want to have rules which restrict what governments might do? Perhaps that's particularly important in the area of rights. Now, when we leave the European Union, we also leave the European Union Charter of Fundamental Rights, 
which in my opinion is far more important than the European Convention and far more wide-ranging. For example, it gives a very wide-ranging right to equality and also a right to health care. And it gives judges the right to strike down or disapply legislation which conflicts with those rights. Now, as I say, we're leaving that, so our rights are guaranteed by Parliament. Now, the other 27 member states, of course, will remain bound by that charter. Now, are our MPs so much more sensitive to the protection of human rights that they can be entrusted with that important function when they can't be so trusted in almost every other democracy in the world, including the other 27 members of the European Union? But wasn't that what the Brexit vote was about, that we wanted to give power back, we wanted to take back control for Parliament as a country, and so that's what we got? Absolutely, take back control. But do the take back controllers mean that they want government to have unlimited power? They said take back control to Parliament. Now, in practice, governments normally control Parliament. Did they say take back control from the courts, which can protect our rights and are not in the same way politically motivated? Do we not rely sometimes on judges to protect our rights rather than MPs who may be swayed by this populist wind and the other? Now, you, you gave a, a, a bit of a hint of the kind of way you'd like to go about the process of starting to develop constitutional arrangements. Let's have this charter that spells out the devolution side of things. But there's clearly a lot more to constitution writing. I mean, do you envisage a, a British equivalent to a guaranteed right to the pursuit of life, liberty and happiness? Well, I'd like to see that sort of thing in the constitution, yes. But the process can't be top down. It can't be people like me telling the country what they ought to have in a constitution. It must be bottom-up and should begin, I think, with a learning process. I mean, the Scots, as you implied a few moments ago, they thought a lot about their constitution, so the Northern Irish. The English, I think, haven't that much. And so I think it might begin with the equivalent of a royal commission, which would travel around the country talking to people and getting an agenda for the constitution makers to work on. It wouldn't be a rapid process it shouldn't be because the constitution has to last for a long time and then once it had been enacted by parliament it should be made subject to referendum and there should be special provisions in referendum so it couldn't be changed too easily it's a long process yeah. But, but I mean, are people rather tired of referendums now? And, and won't a Brexit British government immediately after leaving the European Union have rather more on its plate than just this? I mean, it, it always seems to me, if you look at the history mm. of constitutional reforms in this country, they've either come under enormous pressure in response to some mm. great political crisis, like reform of the House mm. of Lords 100 years ago, mm. or alternatively, they've been done almost absent-mindedly. But nothing in between. There isn't a government in my lifetime, mm. I think, there's really been terribly energised by the thought of, say, further reform of mm. the House of Lords. Some of them have attempted it, as I say, in a lackadaisical way. Is there really the head of steam behind this issue that could make it real? The head of steam, I think, is an unprotected constitution. We're doing something which I think no country has ever done before, moving from a protected system, which is the European Union, to a completely unprotected system in which the government can in practice do what it likes. Parliament is sovereign, can enact any law it chooses. That means in practice a government which controls Parliament can enact any laws that...